1145. In this year, says a contemporary, Robert of Torigny, the people of Chartres began to drag carts harnessed to their own shoulders, laden with stone and wood and other provisions for the building of the new church. The story of the cult of carts takes us to the heart of one of the most remarkable periods in the art of the West, the age of the Gothic cathedrals. And of all the churches built then, one has come to stand for all the rest, Chartres. The church at Chartres was burned down on several occasions between the 8th century and the 12th, but each time the people of Chartres willed its rebuilding. The craftsmen, the sculptors, the glaziers, the masons, the construction workers flooded in from far and wide. But it was the people of Chartres themselves who provided the basis in the money raised by the sale of the produce of their own labors. But they also provided the emotional commitment, and sometimes that could reach fever pitch, as in 1145. In 1194, the church was again burned down, leaving only the great west gate the western towers and the ancient crypt. Miraculously, their most sacred relic, the tunic of the Virgin Mary, survived intact in the crypt to the joy of the people. And even more miraculously, the entire church was rebuilt in 27 years. And that is the church that we can still see today. Now, what the cathedral meant to the people who lived in these streets in the 13th century is very different from what it means today. Then, the cathedral was not only the center of spiritual life, it was the focus of civic pride, and daily life literally revolved around it. As in many medieval towns, the western gates of the cathedral formed one side of a great open square. In the Middle Ages, this was the place where the townspeople could meet the farmers and the produce of the countryside could be bought and sold. Here too, they could mingle with tinkers and peddlers, salt sellers, dealers in relics, and the whole gallery of nefarious characters who thronged the roads of Christendom at that time. The important rituals of people's lives centered in the church. In the church, the infant was baptized, the young were married, and prayers were offered for the souls of the dead. The tremendous outpouring of skill, labor, and faith represented in the age of Gothic cathedrals needs to be understood in the light of the great changes happening in Western Europe between 1100 and 1300. And the most important of these was a dramatic population boom. As Europe grew more stable and more prosperous, Men and women seem to have married younger and had bigger families. As a result, the population of the West increased threefold in those two centuries, and in the richest parts, up to tenfold. Hundreds of new towns were founded, and the old ones thrived as local and long-distance trade flourished. At the same time, there were new intellectual impulses. 
evidenced best of all in the founding of the great universities, Paris, Oxford and Cambridge. And inside the church, great scholars such as Peter Abelard uh, attempted to wrestle afresh with those eternal problems of the relationship between the rational and logic and faith. So everywhere there was a sense of change. Nowhere is this sense of change revealed more dramatically than in architecture. In a drab suburb of Paris, at the Church of Saint-Denis, once the glorious burial place of the kings of France, we can pinpoint the moment of transition to the new visionary Gothic style. It's very rare in the history of Western architecture when we can see a new style born in a new place in one monument at a very specific moment in time. But such is the case here where, we, for the very first time, the Gothic style was created. William Clark is an art historian who has made new contributions to our knowledge of Saint-Denis and Chartres. The new style of architecture is characterized by these tall, thin columns, their foliage capitals, that lift up the now even ceiling height, a network of pointed arches and rib vaults. These things had been used before, but what's new, indeed unique, here at Saint-Denis is the new sense of the organization of the space. The divisions are now played down in favor of an overall unified space that flows from one side of the building to the other. Here at Saint-Denis, the divisions between units, like the walls between the radiating chapels, have simply disappeared in favor of this vast expanse of space that uh, seems to float around us. And it's filled with light. surface has disappeared and has been replaced by translucent screens of glass. All this was due to the influence of one of the most extraordinary people in 12th century France, the man who conceived the new building, Abbot Suger of Saint-Denis. Suger believed that the light flooding the choir through the stained glass windows becomes divine light a revelation of the Spirit of God. Thus it was possible, he said, to create in a church a strange region of the universe suspended between earth and heaven. In June 1144, Suger consecrated the new choir at Saint-Denis in the presence of the King of France, his nobles, and the chief archbishops and bishops. Dazzled by what they saw, they returned home inspired to equal or even outdo Suger's creation. Reims, Sens, Saint-Lys, Soissons, Beauvais, Canterbury and Chartres would soon show the influence of the new Saint-Denis. The medieval cathedral was the focus of popular pride and intense rivalry for the prestige and importance of a town was determined to a large extent by the size and height and beauty of its cathedral. This rivalry pushed church spires to unprecedented heights. The vaulting too rose higher, shot to a height of 121 feet above the ground. The dimensions of the cathedral at Amiens made it possible for the entire population of the city, some 10,000 people, to attend one ceremony and its vaulting reached a height of 139 feet. Beauvais Cathedral, aiming at a vault of 158 feet, 
went beyond the limits of safety and of medieval engineering skill, and the walls of the choir collapsed. Despite isolated disasters like Beauvais, Gothic triumphed over much of Europe within a few generations. At Canterbury, when the choir was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1174, it was rebuilt in the new Gothic style. England was the first to adopt the Gothic, not surprising in a country with close dynastic and historical links with France. But English architects always tended to go their own way, favouring length over height, evolving their own forms, often by deliberately misinterpreting their French models. By the early 14th century, at Wells Cathedral, the deep-rooted English tendency toward architectural fantasy broke free, producing daring innovation. Most striking and eccentric are the massive strainer arches added to reinforce the supports of the crossing tower. And that most notable of English contributions to Gothic, the elaborately patterned vault with its delicate tracery of stone. During the heyday of Gothic, hundreds of cathedrals and thousands of churches were built across Europe. In that time, it has been estimated that more stone was quarried in France alone than in the entire history of ancient Egypt. At the heart of Gothic was a combination of all the arts, transformed by religious faith into a mystical vision. And it is at Chartres that these elements are felt to have achieved their greatest harmony. On the west front of Chartres, the so-called Royal Portal is the only group to survive the calamitous fire of 1194. The faithful were greeted by rows of Old Testament kings and queens, recalling the biblical ancestry claimed by the 12th century French kings. These Old Testament prophets and kings and queens give us a very clear sense of the new relationship between sculpture and architecture. They stand away from their architectural background. They float serenely in space, touching neither the bottom nor the top. Their lines are dictated by those of the architecture behind them, thus their tall, slim, and vertical proportions. Uh, but they are at the same time remarkably free from their architectural constraints, at once majestic, dignified, but no longer remote. They're very human and approachable in their facial expressions and their emotions. Up above in the tympanum, uh, we have uh, Christ in majesty with the four evangelist symbols. With the elders of the apocalypse uh, and angels, a majestic vision symbolizing, in fact, the promise of salvation. Here we have a serenity and a majesty and above all an approachable humanity that animates the sculpture here. We see in them the very embodiment of the mid-12th century humanism that is so prevalent in the school of Chartres at this very time. One of the most exciting things that happens at Chartres is that you can move from the west front to the north transept 
and you change completely the sense of style in the sculpture. And a complete change that's taken place in the attitude towards the human body. These figures are now much freer and seem to move. They have animated facial expressions. The drapery falls around the bodies and reveals it in its contours. We've got the Old Testament kings and prophets again on both sides. All of these emphasize salvation through sacrifice. Abraham, for instance, is preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac as God commanded him. He looks up at the angel who orders him to substitute the ram. Both the north and south transept portals belong to the new cathedral, built after the 1194 fire. The south side follows shortly after the north, so the same changes we saw there are now even more advanced. Here, for instance, is the warrior Saint Theodore. With the weight borne on one foot, he's liberated from the architectural framework. In contrast to the other biblical figures, for the very first time, he is now dressed and armed as a contemporary 13th century crusader. The human form and its natural depiction, now sanctioned by the church, released the creative energies of the Gothic sculptor. Soon, a great variety of individualized figures blossomed on cathedrals, not only in France, but all over Europe. The great age of Gothic cathedrals then was an unparalleled time of expansiveness in European society. But in saying that, we mustn't forget that during those years, the mass of society was still dependent peasantry, unfree, laboring under an extraordinarily rigid social system. It was perhaps because their lives were so harsh that the cathedral meant so much to them. There could hardly be a greater contrast between the squalid conditions of their lives and the splendor of the cathedral to which they quite literally looked up. Here in Chart, we see the culmination of 50 years of architectural experimentation and development, all brought together by a master builder and to create a completely new sense of Gothic space. We start at the floor with those tall, uh, lean pillars that rise majestically from the floor, uninterrupted towards their capitals and their arcades, and on the front side, directly towards the vaults. The second level is that horizontal wall passage that provides a little relief from the vertical, and that prepares us for the most spectacular achievement at Chart, those enormous clear story windows. Uh, windows that are as tall as the arches below, and windows that take up the full expanse of the wall. That marks it as the beginning of the classic age of French Gothic cathedrals, the period that we call the High Gothic. Chartres has more of its original glass than any other medieval cathedral.
what makes possible the size of those windows and the openness of that wall is, in fact, the last major structural advance in Gothic architecture, the external flying buttresses that take all the weight and the pressures from the vaults, from the timber roof, and transfer it away from the wall directly into the ground. Romanesque architecture doesn't have this advantage. There, we have short, heavy piers, thick walls with small windows, round arches, and groin vaults, creating solid but not very tall buildings. In the Gothic church, the walls do not carry the whole weight of the structure. The inner piers are slim and narrow, the rib vaults are thin under a tall timber roof. Massive windows take up most of the wall. This openness was possible because the structural support has been moved to the outside. Massive upright piers surround the building. Giant arches, like great arms, spring from them to resist the pressures of weight and wind. I like uh, particularly in Chad, and I think it is unique, it's all its uh, ensemble of stained glass. It gives an atmosphere, it uh, gives really what the people of the time wanted to be. Uh, it is a church, it is a church in which people pray. So the stained glass is to give a light which is not natural life, which is another light. Anne Prache is an eminent French medievalist who has devoted much of her professional life to the study of the Cathedral of Chartres and its stained glass windows. The moment you get inside this church, the light changes, so you are really in another world, in a sacred world. It must have been a very great enterprise to uh, decorate such a church. Uh, it is supposed to cover about seven acres of windows, which is something terrific when you think of the means the people had at the time. The church is dedicated to the Virgin, and you find her everywhere. She is the center of all the decoration of the church. If you look at the central window on the west facade, which is the larger window ever made in the 12th century, 11 meters, something like 30 feet high, you have a great composition, a kind of decoration, just as you could see on murals or on tapestries or on great mosaics. You can see that on top of the window she is enthroned between angels, so she is really the queen of heaven. The cathedrals of the Gothic age, like Chartres, were indeed, as Abbot Suger had said, new works suffused by new light. In that combination of soaring stonework, sculpture, and painted glass, they had created an art to set beside and even to surpass the works of classical antiquity. As we've seen, theirs was a living art which had taken centuries to come to fruition, and it still has the power to astonish us by the sheer quantity and quality of the great churches, the vast areas they covered, the huge spaces they enveloped, and their ethereal beauty. Their art originated slowly and painfully, but those who came after them, the artists whom we now call those of the early Renaissance, 
would truly be standing on the shoulders of giants.